This is George Vedits. I did a lot of research on him via books and the internet. Among the books I read, I found a book authored by Sue Mather in which she describes the deaf experience, including Deaf Pride, Our Struggles, and the Things We Have Fought For. It was a powerful book. George Vedits was a German. He was born in Maryland to German immigrants. He was an extremely talented individual. During his lifetime, he received many honors and awards. He was an educator and taught at CSDB, the Colorado School for the Deaf, for about 20 years. In the forefront of his mind was his advocacy for deaf people. He was the originator of the vlog. His medium was not the internet, but film. He could have put his ideas on paper, but that was not going to have the impact he desired. It was sign language, the demonstration and mastery of sign language in its native form that was the point. English would not do. I saw his film at Colorado State University. My wife is a doctoral student there. CSU's library has a deaf cultural collection, which includes a copy of George Vedits's famous film. When I watched him on film, the visual beauty of the language stood out. Vedits used the film to sound an alarm. He explained that all children of sign can thank our God above for the gifts that he has given to us, our beautiful sign language. When I painted the portrait of George Vedits, it was important to me that I conveyed a depth and respect for him. He lived in Colorado Springs. In the background, you can see the Red Mountains. The mountains have jagged vertical lines that create irregular shapes. Because of this, there's a feeling of freedom. The shapes move freely and convey that physical openness and freedom. George Vedits loved the area. It was a place where you were one with nature and everything came together and made sense. There was no sound here. That was not part of this natural experience. The richness of the mountains parallel the richness of our physical hands and the language they convey. This richness was expressed in his film. Behind George Vedits in the midground is the Colorado School for the Deaf. On the right side of the portrait is a dove. The dove represents peace. Vedits loved birds and was also a breeder of birds. He won many ribbons and awards for the birds he bred. He was also a master chess player. He placed second in many American chess tournaments. He played against many hearing competitors and was among the best. On the right side of the portrait, to the right of the Red Mountains, is a snow-capped mountain. It represents chess. The ice cap is in the shape of a hand holding a chess piece, the mountain. The green shapes in the sky are four hands. They represent birds in flight. They are not uniform in shape. They represent the freedom a bird has in flight. Vedits won awards as a breeder, and he also appreciated birds in flight. Their freedom and that vision of freedom parallels the message Vedits wanted for deaf and hard of hearing children. Their freedom of choice. The central figure, George Vedits, shows a strong and capable individual. And in the grass behind Vedits are the flowering of hands from the seed Vedits planted. Vedits was a promoter. He advocated for sign language. He didn't want to see the language taken away. He wanted to see it progress into the future generation, and his form embodies that feeling. 
Here is an American flag indicative of the country in which he was raised, the U.S. When I paint individual portraits, I always place the individual's country flag in the portrait somewhere. It will also reflect the culture of their style and dress. In this portrait, the flag is on the school campus. When making the inner frame, I made each of the hand shapes individually and purposefully unique. I didn't want the shapes to look realistic. I wanted them to be an artistic expression. And as I worked on each of the hand shapes, I made an artistic decision about each. If the shape did not possess the feeling I wanted, I started over again. And as each shape was made, I set it onto the frame and painted it. The hand shapes are representative of all signed languages. They do not exclusively represent ASL. Vedits was multilingual. For example, he knew German. There are no rules or specific grammar or syntax to these hands. They are like a gestalt. Like theater, they embody the multicultural and timelines as languages evolve. When Vedits appeared in his film, he didn't sign the way modern American Sign Language speakers sign. He signed the concept for help, for example, showing the location of the hand at the elbow and not in neutral space as modern signers use it. Within his film, he masterfully chose the sign and the way he wanted to express his message. The black background color was chosen because it is reminiscent of military clothing and of protection. And when you think of civil rights, it's like a war of words. I chose it because of Vedits' commitment to civil rights of deaf people. The black color is protecting us as we fight for our rights. As rights are won, the world is expanded. So I didn't want the inner frame to be geometric. I didn't want a hard edge square because our rights have been won incrementally. As small victories occur, our world expands that much. There is an amorphous frame containing the deaf world, and as the deaf world expands, it pushes outward. The thick outer frame shows boldness and strength. It's saying, I am here. A thin outer frame would not do. I wanted to convey the strength of the man. The outer frame has depth as well. It's a wooden frame. This bird in the sky on the right has a branch in its beak. It is just like the biblical story of Noah. But this bird has found ASL, a five-edged leaf, a hand. The bird is bringing ASL and is received and it is shared. You can see the color contrast in the mountain as well. On the right between the white and the dark blue gives a feeling of change in temperature. And from right to left, the colors of mountains contrast. The geometric shapes used in the school reflect the strictness of the environment. I mix the hard with the soft, as well as contrast throughout the composition. The dove is grasping golden hands, which represent a tremendous value to us. Hands are our means of communication. I know that deaf people can communicate with written language, but that is not our language. That is not who we are. That it's got it. He understood that many, many years ago. He was an educator, and he taught for 20 years. He used his experience as a proving ground. We need sign language, and I couldn't agree more. The dove is bringing golden hands, so precious and so valuable. They were an important part of this portrait. As Vedits would say, they are a gift. And as I worked on this portrait, it was important for me to get the things exactly right. I did Vedits' face three times before I was satisfied with it. The first two renditions I just didn't like. 
One looked too old, the other one too thick. This third image portrays him as he was, younger and foreign and culturally German. This one looked right. The surface of his face is a little thicker because I redid it. When I did my research on George Vedits, I learned that he was a master bird handler. It's interesting, in Europe and in Israel as well, people who raise birds will also play with the birds. And what is popular is that the handler will have food and he'll throw it up in the air. The bird will take off and catch the food in the air. Handlers, and I remember my grandmother doing this as well, will become creative. They'll throw the food behind the bird's back. The bird will do a back flip in order to catch the food. Sometimes the food is thrown up to the right or to the left, and the bird responds. As a result, it looks as if the birds are dancing in midair and doing all sorts of tricks. I've represented that concept with these birds in the sky of the portrait. Sometimes they lose control, while other times they nab the food. My grandmother was an expert at this. She would throw handful upon handful of food up in the air, and the birds would respond by continually spinning in a series of flips to get the food. She used her voice as well. She'd throw the food and use her voice. Sometimes she'd just use her voice without throwing the food but the bird still responded and flapped around looking for the food. She was training them in this flying theater. She noticed that if the bird was flying too far to the left or too far to the right when it returned to the ground, she'd catch it and she'd remove one of its feathers from one side to the other. This was done to keep the bird in balance. And then she'd send them back up again. My grandmother had four or five birds that she trained. Some of the birds were too old or out of shape, and some were too big. I'd always look forward to summer vacation at my grandmother's house. My grandmother would take me aside, and we'd look at the young birds, and she would discuss their potential. I enjoyed watching the birds as she worked with them. She told me that one of the most important things was to move them around in the sky. She'd start a bird off to the right, and then she'd have it move over to the left and back again, as well as up and down. And within this portrait, because I knew that George Vedits was an expert birdsman and had won awards for his birds, I wanted to incorporate that concept as well, and I made an artistic decision to put it in here. This piece, Beauty of Diversity, represents the earth and all of the opportunities that are before us. Here in the middle is a double helix, strands of DNA. It's representative of my family and of the 26 deaf family members we've had across the generations. On the right side, the colors in between the DNA strands are regular colors. As you move left, you see images of hands. That's when deaf people emerged and when sign language emerged in our family. When children are young, they're often connected with animals they see in their world. Their first signs relate to animals. Young children tend to use hand shapes which look like the number five or a claw, and they enjoy talking about animals. And I'm not talking about fingerspelling or written language. It's theatrical expression of animals and sign language. That concept is represented below the DNA on the bottom. On the left is a galloping horse. Next to that on the right is an animal interacting with the horse. From the bottom, building upon this concept, over here to the left is a thumbnail of my first painting as an artist, Flowers of Language. I thought about the colors that I used from bottom to top. The animals are first signs at the bottom, all the way up to the top with the rainbow. The rainbow has a diversity of colors and goes on forever. There is a black bird within the rainbow that represents a block of some sort, for example, broken hands. I wanted to add this element as well. It's strange. Over here on the right is a chicken. It's wearing a crown, showing that he's a king. 
and the shape of a crown looks like the forehand shape. Next to the chicken is a cat. Notice the shape of the cat's head is the same shape as the hand shape for the sign of cat. Below the cat is a snake ready to strike. You can see that the snake's head is ready to strike. Its shape is that of a claw. Our hands are ready for language. Hand shapes are readily made. In the center, is a, the diversity of hands are integrated in the piece. Here between the thumbnail and the river are a series of frames. Each represents a different way of expressing oneself. It's like a reel of film with its own story. It's a series of cards of different signs, one next to the other. On the left, where the colors are more muted, represents death. On the right, the series represents life. Looking from right to left, you can see a bridge which spans the river. The series of cards spans the river, as does the double helix. The movement here is lateral, and there's a growth on the right that continues and will carry on. You can see the organic hills and shapes. Up here, the rainbow is seen as if it were continuing off the canvas. Consider the story of Noah's Ark. The animals were gathered two by two. This painting is similar, except where the animals are on Noah's Ark, ASL, ISL, and the world sign languages. Their hands populate this piece. We know each country has its own native sign language. French sign language is different than Italian sign language. Each language has its own depth and richness. Each language works. The earth is a powerful giver. The beauty of our hand shapes that give words enable us to express meaning, and that infinitely continues. And this is from the heart. It's inspirational. Let me explain this outer area between the frames. In lab, scientists look under microscopes to identify healthy versus sick cells those with viruses or microorganisms with them. There are people who are overly protective and isolate themselves from others in the world. They shun opportunities for translation of their languages into other languages. They are ultra-protective, and they are represented by the army color green in this middle area. Within this area are lightly colored shapes as well. They're beautiful and provide strength. The gold of this mat symbolizes the richness. It shows that language is sophisticated and deserves its rightful and elevated place. I'd like to talk about this chair. I'll never forget the Six-Day War that happened in 1967 in Israel. I spent many days just sitting. I was at a school in Jerusalem. It was in the afternoon and I was in class. The teacher heard a warning and there were machine guns. He went out and checked. Sure enough, an emergency had been sounded. We asked him what was wrong. We were deaf and couldn't hear anything. He said he heard very loud machine guns. I thought even though we were deaf, if we were by the windows, we should hear the machine guns. The sounds were off in the distance near the old part of Jerusalem. Our school was about two kilometers away on Jaffo Street. We had to go to an underground shelter, and there we sat. There were flashlights, but we didn't have any batteries. We looked around. We used candles. We were grouped together and sat in circles, and we needed light. We were deaf. We must have light to communicate. We were in small groups, and each group had one candle. The chair is reflective of that experience. On the seat, you can see the design. Each hand represents a signing person, and there is a candle in the middle. During that experience, we had a difficult time understanding one another because of the distortion that the candlelight caused.
and we couldn't be too far away from the candle or we wouldn't be able to see each other. So we slowed down the pace of our signing so that we could better understand one another. Since we were classmates, we often understood each other even if the signs weren't completely intelligible. We played some games. We were down there for four days. Imagine that, four days long. The only light were from the tiny windows above us near ground level. The windows are reflected in the chair back. We were in a safe place while the war was going on, but there was nothing for us to do. We talked and gestured to one another to try to think up ideas, and it became boring. But after a while, our eyes had adjusted to our darker surroundings, and we were able to sign and communicate to each other. When we could communicate with these, we talked a lot. It was fun. One night, there was a very, very loud sound. I was asleep. The vibration of the stone floor woke me up. If we heard it, you know it had to be a very loud explosion. I was thinking about my parents. They were far away. We had no contact with one another, and I didn't know what they were doing, and I wondered why they hadn't come to pick me up already. I mean, why was I in this place? I didn't get it. The adult who was taking care of us was amazing. She didn't sound the alarm. She had a smile on her face and was very positive throughout. She was a Holocaust survivor, and she was a strong and confident woman. And she said that there was nothing to worry about. Even though we countered with concern, she didn't waver. Because she was so confident, and I had known her, I trusted what she said. She gave no direct answers, and she never used the word war. She maintained that the sounds we heard and felt were nothing to be worried about. For the next two days, the fighting was so close we could see flashes of lights in the windows above us, and then the fighting moved further away. After four days, the war was over, and it was time for us to leave the shelter and go back into the world. It was strange and awkward. It seemed so bright outside. It took time for our eyes to adjust, and our leg muscles were tight, which made it difficult for us to walk at first. My dorm was a short distance from the shelter. When I got back to my room, it was a mess. Many things were broken. The windows were taped, similar to this window on the back of the chair. That's done to prevent shattering. And this blue paint, too. In some of the houses and at the school, the windows were painted blue so that people inside could still use lighting at night. Because they were painted blue, they wouldn't be detected by military aircraft. They did that with car lights as well. I'll never forget seeing the blue paint and the tape on the windows. It was strange for me to see all of that. The dorm supervisors didn't clean the windows. We kids had to do it. The tape was hard to get off the windows. We had to clean off the paint as well. There was a lot of work that we had to do. There were a lot of shell casings and missile casings and other military equipment as well that we found. Some of the things we found were bullet sized while others were fairly sizable and heavy. We had to collect it all and put it in a box for the military to pick up. When you saw all of the debris, you could imagine what had gone on above the ground during those days when we were in the shelter. If I had been in my dorm room, no doubt I would have been Im injured. The decision to have us stay in the bomb shelter was the right decision. It saved us. And if you look at the window on the chair back, similar metal bars were on the windows. And believe it or not, missile fire was able to break through. Parts of the metal protecting the window would be gone, and you can see that here. Part of this metal is gone as well. It was amazing to me that the bars could be damaged like that. The chair frame with the fluted edge represents the good fortune we had that we had candlelight, which enabled us to communicate while we were in the shelter. Without the candlelight, we would have been cut off from one another which would have added to our trauma. We were fortunate to have the candlelight to keep us connected. This experience was not a terrible one. I didn't suffer from it. But it is one that I'll never forget. And this chair represents a poignant moment in my childhood.
The female figure here represents an expectant mother whose body is changing as it starts to produce milk for her baby. She's worrying about her child and wondering if the baby will be deaf or if it will have other issues. This DNA necklace symbolizes her genetic heritage. She's thinking of the deaf people who have been born throughout the generations and worrying if her child will have new and different issues. Her facial expression reflects this. She's wondering if the child will be perfect or not. And she's worrying about if the child will live up to the world's expectations. These issues are consuming her. Yet she wants to be presentable both personally and genetically. The vase on the left shows uncertainty about the future of signing. Will sign language continue? Will it last and be vibrant? The stems represent written language and thought, but there is only one sign language flower left. There's a petal which has fallen to the floor already. The question remains, what will happen to the sign languages of the world? The vase itself has a feminine shape that mirrors the woman in the foreground. Both images play off one another and are reflective of the thought processes of each. There are deep, rich colors here, and the window behind the vase all are representative of the contemplation that is happening. You can see in the woman's eyes and the mouth. We're unsure if she's optimistic or melancholy, and we're unsure of her station in life. As you look at the picture, you can see the symbols of how busy her mind is. But here's an alternate point of view. Nothing's wrong. The mirror reflects exactly who I am. I'm okay. There's nothing wrong. No need to worry. All is fine. And that's the end of that story. There were many issues that I worked my way through. This is truly a culmination. It represents my breakthrough and how I realized my mark and my identity as a painter and an artist. Hand shapes. Language begins as thought processes in the brain. They travel to the front of the head and back through the heart, and then they are expressed in sign language. There's no mediation. It's direct and efficient. Think of this on a child's level. This is easy for a child to read. This particular shape looks like an animal that's swimming. Or this one, a giant bear. Or this one, a boy falling backwards. There's not one right perspective with this painting. Any angle is right side up. And depending on your point of view, you will see a variety of possible images. This could be a wolf, or if you saw this one from another perspective, a shrimp. Whatever the person sees is fine. Our minds are pliable as well. At a more advanced level, this represents the multitude of thoughts we have. In the art world, artists like Picasso and Dali have a specific style or identity. Each work began internally within the artist and developed to meet external expectations. Museums and scholars formulate boundaries. Here is my mind, and there is clarity that I can reflect outwards. In my other paintings, you can identify components of culture and of community. Each analysis would be dependent on the subject of the painting that you were viewing. This painting is unique in that it communicates the genesis of my design, the genesis of the scale, the beauty, the color balance, and the contrast. The frame, and particularly the color green, represents peace. Green is soft, warm, bright, inviting. It's an earth color. 
Those elements come together within the painting and are communicated through language and through theater. The canvas that I used is sturdy and materially heavy. I needed weight and strength to support my technique. I also use a wooden tool, tool to sculpt the image. As I do so, I apply a lot of pressure to the surface. Afterwards, I apply the color and the detail. The strength and weight of the canvas enable me to utilize my technique. This painting is one of free expression without boundaries, without limitations or rules. Also on the mat, the DNA's double helix meanders freely around the painting. Everything was unforced and natural. Looking at the colors in the painting, here on the left in this shape, I used a blood red color. It adds interest. For the color composition on the right are solids. On the left, there's more complexity. Thoughts are emerging. You can see it in the yellow hands. Each side complements the other. There's red in these hands, pinks. I look for the color balance as I take in the whole. 